Do not let your hearts be troubled. And do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about itself. For even though you walk through the darkest valley, and in the shadow of death, fear no evil. For I am with you. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. For the Lord your God goes with you. For if you belong to the world, it would have loved you as its own. But as it is, you do not belong to the world. For this time, I have told you these things, so that in me, you may have peace. For in this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Good morning, Spinning Road Baptist Church. Happy Easter to you. Jesus is risen. He is risen indeed. And even though we can't be together in this room, we are together to celebrate our Resurrection Sunday. So let us do so as we sing In Christ Alone as Jim leads us. Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe. This gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save. Till on that cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on Him was laid. Here in the death of Christ I live. There in the ground His body lay. Light of the world by darkness slain. Then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again. And as he stands in victory, sin's curse has lost its grip on me. For I am his and he is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. The power of Christ, I'll stand. Here in the power of Christ, I'll stand. Our scripture passage for today is found in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 27, starting with verse 35. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. 
and sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Above his head, they placed the written charge against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Two robbers were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, You who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. In the same way, the robbers who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. If you are at all affiliated with our Awana program, then you are aware of the theme verse that which we have the kids memorized and which the word Awana is based, which stands for approved workmen are not ashamed. It's found in 2 Timothy 2.15 that says, Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. In other words, if a Christian is not able to know what's in the Bible, and to know what he's talking about when he's talking about the truth of God, then sooner or later he's going to be ashamed or embarrassed. There will be a time when his lack of study will be exposed. Sort of like the guy who says that he knows karate, and everybody's impressed with his knowledge of karate, and he talks a lot about it and seems to know a lot about it, until he has to actually defend himself against a real fighter, and, or else somebody challenges him to break some boards or something like that. And then he has to admit that he doesn't really know much about karate. He's embarrassed for making such claims, and he's ashamed to be caught in his lie. Well, in a similar way, there will surely be a time when you as a Christian will be called upon to share your faith. There will be a tragedy, and your friends will look to you because they know you're a Christian, and maybe you can help them. Perhaps you've already experienced this with this coronavirus, where people are looking to you for some answers. Or perhaps someone will challenge Christianity, or they'll challenge the Bible, and they will look to you for what your answer is going to be. Or someone will want to know if something that they heard is consistent with the Bible's teaching, and they will ask you what you think. Now, there may be some situations where you can fake it for a while. If you've been to church enough, or uh, you've been to Sunday school, or heard sermons, you might be able to, to come up with some answers. If you've been to summer camp, or you watched enough Christian television, you might be able to recall some of those emotional cliches that uh, make people feel better for a while. But sooner or later, a situation is going to come down to whether or not you have correctly handled the Word of God. I like the King James translation of this verse. Instead of the phrase, correctly handles, it says, rightly dividing, rightly dividing the word of truth. I like that. Studying the word of God has a lot to do with dividing. You break it open and you sort it out. You take the various parts and you piece them together. You figure out what they mean and what they have to do with your life. And the unique thing about the word of God is that while we're dividing it, it's dividing us. Hebrews 4.12 says, The word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. The word of God is something that we have to make decisions about. What do we really believe? How have we decided what these words on a page mean to us? What difference do they make in how we live day to day? And the truth of God's word is something that is dividing us. It separates those who would come to Christ in faith from those who would reject him. It's like a sharp knife that slices right through the middle of a piece of bread, separating the two pieces. Your response to God's word puts you on one side or the other. The sword has cut through soul and spirit, joint and marrow, and there's nothing left in the middle. You're on one side or the other. The Easter story is a prime example of how God's word cuts right to the core of things. If there's anything that would seem more unbelievable than what the Bible asks us to believe about this story, I don't know what it could be. 
Yet, what you have decided about this story will ultimately determine your eternal destiny. If you have decided that it is the truth, and you have asked the risen Lord to forgive your sins because he took your punishment and he conquered death forever, then you are bound for heaven. Much of the world has decided that this story is simply a legend or a fairy tale, or maybe it has some kind of allegory to symbolize a spiritual point of some sort. And just like they've taken Jonah and turned him into Pinocchio and more of a, a, a fantasy figure, they've made Jesus into a, a holiday fantasy figure whose story children eventually just outgrow when they're old enough to figure it out. If this is what you have decided, that the resurrection of Jesus is just a make-believe story, then you are on the road to hell. God's word has divided you. It has separated you unless you go back and rethink how you want to divide up this account of Jesus' death and resurrection. As I read through the biblical accounts of this, I took notice of something unique from the many other times that I've read it. This concept of dividing just seemed to jump out at me. There were several things that were divided when Jesus died, and those divisions bear significance when you think of what it was that people were deciding about Jesus that day. And then, when Jesus rose from the dead, there were definite decisions that made people be forced to divide the truth and to figure out what they were going to believe. I would like us to look this morning at those divisions that took place that week of Christ's death and resurrection, and what they have to do with how we divide the truth of God. As our passage for today tells us, it was as Jesus hung from the cross that the Roman soldiers divided up Jesus' clothes by casting lots for them. Whether they wanted some souvenirs of this event, or whether they just wanted some free clothes, I don't know. But I can hardly think of anything as crass and as unfeeling as what they did that day. The biblical writers recorded this detail to identify it as a fulfillment of prophecy. Psalms 22 is a foreshadowing of the crucifixion, and there are many details given about what happened that day Jesus died in this psalm. And verse 18 actually says, They divide my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. Details like this are given to us to identify it as a fulfillment of prophecy so that we can do an efficient job of dividing the truth. If there were just one or two parallels from the Old Testament, someone could easily say, well, that's just a coincidence. But there are so many details in the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ that are direct fulfillments of what the Scripture said about the Messiah. That if you take those details and you take those prophecies and you divide them up and you sort them out and you do it rightly, you do it correctly, there is only one possible conclusion that you can make. That Jesus is the Son of God and His death was the fulfillment of God's plan and that there is no other name under heaven given among men except the name of Jesus Christ by which we can be saved. One centurion, a commander of many of these same Roman soldiers, did precisely that. When he saw all that had taken place, he was able to divide the truth. He looked up and he said, Surely this was the Son of God. But these other soldiers saw this as an opportunity to gamble for some articles of clothing showing just how lightly they were taking the most significant event in all history. Likewise, there are many who choose to gamble with the most precious of possessions. God has given us the choice of eternal life or death, and so many people fail to divide the truth. They think that you can't just be sure about all this Christianity stuff, even though God has given us so much on which to base our decision. And so what they do is just live their lives for their own pleasure disregarding God's commandments, disregarding His warnings, ignoring His invitations to come to Him. And what they are doing is gambling with their own eternal destiny. I don't, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they're right. Maybe there's no God. Maybe Jesus didn't come to earth to take the punishment of our sins. Maybe no one has really risen from the dead. Maybe there's nothing to worry about if you do die without trusting in Christ. Maybe I have divided the truth all wrong like to ask you, would you like to gamble on that? Would you like to wager your eternal life on that? Only a fool would make that bet. Only someone who did not rightly divide the truth would gamble with the most precious of all things, 
the garments of righteousness that belong to those who love Jesus. As we look at another aspect of the crucifixion, we see that two criminals were divided. They were literally divided by Jesus, one on his left and one on his right. The Bible tells us that they heaped insults at Jesus, challenging him to come down from the cross if he really were the Son of God. Those passing by, as well as the religious leaders, took up the mockery, and they laughed at the notion that this pitiful, pitiful figure, hanging bloody and beaten on the cross, could actually be the Son of God. But then something happened. We don't know exactly what, but Luke's Gospel tells us that one of those criminals had a change of heart. As everyone was mocking Jesus, he realized, in the last moments of his life, that this man hanging beside him was innocent of any wrongdoing. The only man who has ever lived who was innocent of any wrongdoing, and who therefore must be willingly giving his life to save sinners. And so this criminal challenged the mockers, and then believed in his heart and confessed with his mouth that Jesus Christ was Lord. Those simple words he said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Acknowledge first of all the Lordship of Christ, and also his faith that Jesus would live again. And it was enough for Jesus to respond, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. Maybe up to this point you have been with the multitudes who mock the claims of the Christian faith. You've always thought the Christians were just hypocrites or kooks, and you wanted to separate yourself from them. Maybe you're here today watching this podcast because Grandma asked you to, or maybe it's Easter and you wanted to do something religious. Or maybe you are searching today and you're looking for something to bring meaning in your life, and that has brought you to our podcast today, and we're so glad that that has happened. Or maybe in your mind you have believed the things that you've heard about Jesus, but you never thought that they had all that much to do with you. You don't feel that you're worthy of his sacrifice, or you just have never decided to apply it to your own life. Well, if that describes you, then you have not divided the truth. But if this story teaches us anything, it teaches us that it's not too late. If even a dying criminal could figure out who Jesus is and reach out to him and with his last breath ask him to save him, then you too can divide the truth today. This shows the very power of God over sin. Do not wait until you think that you're just about to die before you reach out to him. Things may not go as you plan and your life may be required of you long before you are ready. This coronavirus has taught us that. It's something for us to think about. Don't wait until it might be too late. They say that true repentance is never too late, but that late repentance is seldom true. If you think you have plenty of time, you may be wrong. If you think that you can just say a few words at your deathbed and then slip into heaven, then you are actually just proving your unbelief by rejecting Christ now. If you have decided to divide that truth rightly, then you will acknowledge right now Jesus is Lord and Savior. For there will be a day when it will be too late. We read about something else that was divided the day of Jesus' death. In Matthew 27, verse 50, we read about the fact that the curtain that was in the temple was torn from top to bottom. No person went in there and ripped it. It just tore by the power of the unseen hand of God. That curtain represents a division. It separated one part of the temple from the rest of the temple. It divided two different parts. On one side of the curtain was what is called the Holy of Holies, or the Most Holy Place, where for centuries had housed the Ark of the Covenant and the symbols of the, the Holy Presence of God. No one could go past that curtain into that Holy of Holies except one man, the High Priest, and only one day of the year, on the Day of Atonement when the priest would offer a sacrificed animal to appeal for God's forgiveness for the people. Well, that curtain also represented the division between God and man. Man could not approach God by himself. Now, God, in his mercy, established the terms by which man's sins could be forgiven and for man to be able to be in fellowship with him through a, through a sacrificial system that lasted for centuries. But still, sin separated man from God. And those requirements had to be followed, or else man would remain separated and lost in his sin. But then, Jesus died, and the curtain was torn. What had been the divider was now divided, 
And each of us is given access to that most holy place, that holy of holies, where we can come to God and we can ask for his cleansing and his forgiveness because the price has been paid in full. There's nothing more that we could possibly do to appease the wrath of God towards sin than what has already been done for us on the cross. And now, because that barrier was divided and torn, what determines whether we are forgiven and whether we have fellowship with God is not whether or not we follow all the regulations, not whether we do all the do's and don't do all the don'ts, but rather it's what we've decided about Jesus. And this is where it is so vital to understand that the story didn't end on the cross. The most crucial decisions to be made are about what happened after Jesus died. This is where we have to further divide the truth. Jesus died. Our punishment was paid. We don't have to offer sacrifices anymore. What wonderful news that is. But is that it? Is there anything more? You better believe there's more. We're here today. Each of you in your homes, we're here together at Spinning Road Baptist Church to proclaim the truth that Jesus was dead and buried, but that God raised him up from the grave, and he lives forevermore. He not only beat sin, but he beat death. And it is what you believe about that that determines whether you have a dead religion or a live faith. It's what you have decided about that which determines whether someone just bought you a gift or whether you have received that gift and you've opened it. Now, even those who loved Jesus and were closest to him had a hard time believing this. The women who went to the tomb early that Sunday morning weren't sure what to believe at first, but it didn't take them long to divide the truth. Luke tells us in his gospel in chapter 24, verse 8, that they remembered his words. They put the pieces together, that this is what Jesus had told them would happen, and they embraced that truth with ecstatic joy. They remembered his words. But when the women ran to tell the disciples, the disciples didn't believe them. It seemed like nonsense. They were still not able to divide the truth. Then later that day, two men were walking on the road heading toward the town of Emmaus, and Jesus appeared to them, obviously appearing differently than he did in his pre-resurrected body. They didn't know who he was. But then, when he sat down to eat with them, he gave thanks and he broke the bread, and then they knew. He divided the bread, and they divided the truth. And they said later, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road? And he opened up the scriptures. The truth was given to them, but they had to divide it and come to a conclusion. Those two disciples ran back to Jerusalem to tell the rest of the disciples, as we see in Mark 16. But even then, the disciples didn't believe them either. It was just so hard for them to believe. And so Jesus appeared later to those disciples, and he rebuked them for not believing. They should have known. They had been given the truth. They just hadn't divided it rightly. And so he gave them another chance, basically saying, don't mess it up. And Jesus told them again that this is what he had been teaching them. This is how things had to be for sin and death to be conquered once and for all. And he gave them another chance to hear the truth and to divide it rightly. And that they did. They went forth and they preached the gospel of Christ, reaching the uttermost parts of the world so that the same truth has now reached us all these miles away and all these years later. And now it's up to us to divide the truth. Maybe up to this point you have not reached that conclusion that Jesus really is alive and that by believing in him you can be born again and you can have life in his name. Well, God's giving you another chance, just like he did his disciples. Don't mess it up. Divide up all that God has shown you. Look at the facts. Listen to what he's speaking to your heart and your soul and your mind and respond with your voice. As Romans 10.9 says, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And all those who are believers here, part of Spinning Road Baptist Church and your family and those who have joined this podcast. We've come to worship Christ, the risen King. Let us continue to divide the word of truth so that we realize more day by day that because Jesus has risen, that we don't have to sin anymore. He has given us a new nature, enabling us to crucify the old nature and to walk in newness of life. Jesus risen from the grave means that it's no longer just a case of, well, thank goodness I don't have to go to hell. 
but rather it's praise God, I can live in purity and holiness by the power of the resurrection. That is the Easter message. A wonderful old Easter song that Colleen and I love says, Love crucified arose, the risen one in splendor, Jehovah's sole defender has won the victory. Love crucified arose, and the grave became a place of hope, for the heart that sin and sorrow broke is beating once again. Shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the message of Easter, for the resurrected life that we have through our faith in Jesus. Lord, help us to live victorious lives because you have won the victory for us. Help us to know that nothing can separate us from your love. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come can separate us from your love. How we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Long ago he blessed the earth, born older than the years. And in the stall across he saw, through the first of many tears. A life of homeless wandering, cast on in sorrow's way. The shepherd seeking for the lost, his life the price. Love crucified arose, the risen one in splendor. Jehovah's soul defender has won the victory. Love crucified arose, and the grave became a place of hope. For the heart that sin and sorrow broke is beating once again. Throughout your life you felt the weight of what you come to give. To drink for us that crimson cup so we might really live. At last the time to love and die the dark appointed day that one forsaken moment when your father turned his face away love crucified arose the one who lived and died for me was satan's nail-pierced casualty now he's breathing once again love crucified arose and the grave became a place of hope for the heart that sin and sorrow broke is beating once again love crucified arose the risen one in splendor jehovah's soul defender has won the victory Love crucified arose, and the grave became a place of hope, for the heart that sin and sorrow broke is beating once again. Happy Easter, everybody.